hope those words to that song resonate in your life. That he is, should be our desire in all that we do. Uh, we seek to please him and serve him. A good, great day to be in the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here? Say amen. 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 What a joy. What a joy. See, you could have slept in, could have stayed home, but you would be missing all of these blessings that the Lord has already given us today. Take your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning uh, as we're making our way through uh, really this book for our year. We've uh, settled on the theme of laboring together, uh, which we will see as we move through these scriptures together. Uh, but for today's purposes, uh, we want to consider this thought of uh, developing maturity. Right, developing maturity. I want to look at these verses together. Uh, I read last week the first five verses or so. I won't read those again today. But just be reminded, uh, Paul is addressing this church of Corinth here. And, and what he says in chapter 2 is he, he pretty kind of hones in on how he's addressing them. He says, I didn't come to you with wisdom or excellency of speech. He says, in fact, I just desired to come to you uh, by the Spirit of God working in my life. And, and that's what he was desiring to preach and teach to them as well. So in that context, even there at the, at the very verse 5, rather, of chapter 2, he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We're going to pick up today in verse 6, and I will read through the end of this chapter. We'll read through it quickly, uh, but it'll give us a good context of what's going on. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, if you're there now, how be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, or that word to be grown up or mature. So how be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9 together. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them through them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14 there through the rest of the chapter. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Developing maturity... I spent a really good portion of my life ministering and working with children, with teens. Many of you know that. And, and, and we all know, just by experience, each child develops differently. Uh, some mature faster, I'd say much faster than others, right? We all kind of have a kid in mind where we think, man, that, that young man, that young woman needs to mature uh, a little quicker than they are. We, we, we also understand typically girls mature quicker than boys, all right? Sorry, fellas, it's just the way it is, okay? And, and, and this, is, this is really just 
truth over time. I get asked this often as, well, you know, why is it that girls develop so much quicker than boys? Why do they mature so much quicker than boys? And listen, I've looked at this. I've studied the scriptures. I, I have a, a doctorate in pastoral counseling. And my answer is this. Boys are dumb. Okay? <laughs> they, just, they just are. All right? There's no, there's no way around it. Boys are dumb. Lord willing, those boys will mature. All right, I'll let you decide if you're a man in the room how you matured over the course of your life. But we know that over a course of a child's development, they will move from just simple thinking to more complex reasoning, even in their abilities, right? I have a sixth grade boy, so I, I'm looking forward to this day, okay? When, when he stops the simple thinking and moves into more complex reasoning, he's getting there, but he's got a long ways to go, all right? If you're a parent, many of you in this room are, or even just experienced children in your life, you've watched your child grow from crawling to walking, right? Those were beautiful times. It's, it's a wonderful time when we see our children develop. As I mentioned a moment ago, they then begin to develop more compact, complex skills than just walking or rather just crawling. They'll, they'll begin to, to walk. They'll begin to run. They'll begin to jump. You know, balance is structured. All of those things develop with time. And then we also know that if a child fails to mature in these ways, whether it's physically, maybe it's intellectually, other just areas in their life, it's usually a marker of what might be a bigger problem. In worst case scenarios, they may even be an underlying handicap, right? There's some sort of handicap that's causing the, the, the maturing process or, or what's supposed to take place not to take place. Now with that, we understand that a child or even an adult with a handicap didn't cause the handicap, right? It's not of what they did or, or something they didn't do. It was just how they were born. They were born with that in them. Now, I want to Pair this together with now developing maturity or in our mature Christian life. I believe Paul is, in, is encouraging this church at Corinth to mature in faith rather than to stay where they would suffer, and I worded it this way, a spiritual handicap. Now, the difference between those two terms are, right, we talked about a, a physical handicap we can't control. We know uh, there are just things in the body that happen, and therefore that handicap is in place. However, a spiritual handicap is often because of what we're doing or not doing. So we can always find ways in growing in our faith. We should always be continually desiring and working toward our walk with the Lord. We ought not to remain stagnant or, or content or your, worse yet, what I would say is to spiritually atrophy. Right in my case, many of you know this, what I have is muscular dystrophy. That's why I use the chair, all right? So in my case, my muscles are atrophying. That's what's happening to me. Uh, just uh, in my body, uh, some cells didn't line up just right, and uh, I am missing that gene uh, that, that really helps me keep the healthy cells I need for my muscles to just to continually grow. In fact, I expel the gene faster, the, the good genes faster than you all. So in, in turn, what happens is my muscles atrophy, right? In my case, it's a certain form of muscular dystrophy. We're blessed. It's not supposed to affect my major organs like my heart or my lungs or those kinds of things. But you can tell, you look at me, you can see there is a handicap, right? My, the, my upper legs are affected. Uh, my scalp region, my shoulders, my arms, uh, my face, my smile, right? I've used this illustration many times. I am smiling. This is just all you get, okay? So if you've judged Pastor Fisher, shame on you, all right? I'm not a mean guy. I just don't smile like the rest of you, okay? 
It's the atrophy. That's what's happening in my body physically. I don't want that to happen in our body, spiritually, if you will. Right? I want us to develop maturity. Paul is, I believe, trying to teach this concept, this principle to this church at Corinth, and then I believe is us as well. Now, bear in mind what's happening here. We've talked about it a few times. He was addressing this church, this church at Corinth, because of the divisions within the church. Right? Remember, there were groups within uh, the church that were gathering together, and within those groups, they were just following after their preferred leader in the church. Right? So some followed Paul, some followed Apollos, uh, some followed uh, 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 Cephas. Some said, listen, we just follow Christ, but no one was getting along. Right? The fact is, there were schisms, there were arguments. Uh, th this was just really destroying the church. Last week, we considered that we should keep our focus on what matters, right? We really pointed out that that's what this church wasn't doing, right? They were focused on the wrong thing. They were focused on the men in the church, the leaders that they had selected, rather than the gospel, rather than the most important thing of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul, through these first couple chapters, has been trying to teach them this principle, he did that last week with really pointing out two different worldviews. He said there's a secular worldview, one that's absent of God, one that's absent of absolute, and then there's a biblical worldview. If you're in church this morning, I would hope you would hold to a biblical worldview. That is, God is in control. We have his word. We have absolute. Therefore, we should do everything we can to follow after him. Now, mind you, Paul is addressing all of these issues within this church, right? There's a secular worldview. There's a biblical worldview. You need to focus on what matters. You need to stop following after man. And then we concluded that it's not an argument that changes a person. It's the gospel that changes a person. Right? You can't argue someone into heaven. They have to come to a saving faith of Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Paul's continuing this same conversation. Right, so now for today's purposes, we're in the midst of this conversation he's having with this church. And arguing that we must present this simple gospel, if you will, he's not meaning that the gospel is simplistic or that Christians should not grow in their understanding of the truth. It's not at all what Paul is inferring here. In fact, it's just the opposite. A believer should be maturing in their thinking. A believer should be maturing in their walk with the Lord each and every day. Paul really hammers this home uh, there. If you would turn over just to chapter 3 really quick, we'll read just the first four verses to this church. Mind you, same, same context, continuing the conversation. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? What's Paul teaching here? Mind you, in other words, if we are living in the Spirit, we will be one in the body of Christ. Mind, go back to what he told us here in just the first few verses of chapter 2. He says, I didn't come to you with fancy words. I didn't come to you with fancy speech. I came to you in the power of the Spirit of God, desiring that the Spirit do a work in your life. And then he talks about the Spirit is the one that helps a person mature and to grow. So as we put all of this together, now he's saying, listen, if you as a church, if you and I as believers, if we're living in the Spirit, we will be one in Christ. 
if we're not living in the Spirit, well, then we'll indulge in petty divisions. That's what happened to this church. Paul wanted the Corinthians, and I believe us, to move on to maturity. He said, listen, I fed you with milk because you weren't ready to receive me. And he really says, you know what? You're not quite ready yet, but it's time to get there. It's time to mature. It's time to grow. It's time to allow the spirit of God to work in your life. Mind you, we pointed out these people that he's talking to, these are saved individuals. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. These are people that have a personal relationship with Christ. They've accepted uh, that gospel that we talked about. They accepted that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. They accepted that he gave his life, that he shed his blood, that he rose again. They understood that they were sinners in need of a savior and they called upon Christ to be their savior. These are the people who Paul is addressing. Now he says, it's time to grow up. Time to put these divisions aside. It's time to put this pettiness aside. Focus on what matters, the gospel, and then also allow the spirit of God, now that you're believers, to work in your life and to grow and mature you. It's time to move on from the milk. It's time to get into the meat. So how do we do that? How do we move on to maturity? That's what I want to outline for you this morning. Firstly being, spiritual maturity is not the wisdom of this world. Listen to me. Spiritual maturity is not the wisdom of this world. Those two things don't go together. Look at verse, verse 6. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or growing up or mature, yet not in wisdom of this world, nor in the princes of this world that come to naught. Paul was desiring to teach the church that there was much more to learn in their Christian faith. They needed to grow. They needed to continue to grow. One was quoted saying this, the marvelous thing about the gospel is that is simple enough for a child, but profound enough that even the finest theologian cannot fully probe its depth. I thought, boy, that's a pretty good statement. That's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? It's simple enough for a child to understand, yet the highest educated Bible scholar, we still can't probe its depth. There's so much there to it. Spiritual maturity and academic knowledge are, are not at all the same thing. We don't have to look very far to see that in our world today. A person can possess a ton of education and remain a spiritual infant. This world could conclude that you or I have a brilliant mind, and yet you could be spiritually immature. We see very smart people in our world. They still reject God. Because it's not about the world's wisdom. Those that reject God, it's pretty simple. They just don't get it. They just don't get it. Look at verse 14 teaches that principle there in chapter 2. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They just don't get it. We see this over and over in our society today. Those of, those of us that would consider to be conservative, I'm sure watch a certain news organization at times. You ever notice how there's many that are would consider to be themselves agnostic. I mean, there are many that would consider themselves to be Christian, but there are many that <coughs> plainly consider themselves to be agnostic. Now, they're very smart. 
They're, they're very intellectual people. And, and you look at someone like that and you say, how can you have those similar moral compass? How can you have similar moral values? How can you have kind of that conservative line of thinking and, and you just don't understand the gospel? You just don't receive Christ as your Savior. They don't get it. It's foolishness to them. Paul said these people can't understand the truth. To these people, the message of the gospel, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. They look at it and they kind of turn their cheek to it. They, no, no, that's just not for me. You ever met anybody like that? No, no, there's got to be a different way to get to heaven than that. No, no, you, 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 can, you can believe what you want about Christ and the cross, but that's just, that's just not for me. It's not for my family. They don't get it. It's foolishness. It doesn't even really make sense in their mind. As we seek spiritual maturity, we must not mistake the wisdom of the world for the wisdom of God's spirit. Paul says the rulers of this age, he says, are coming to nothing. Verse 6 there again, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. In other words, they're headed nowhere. The knowledge of this world, the wisdom of this world, the princes of this world, the rulers of this world, they're headed nowhere. Spiritual maturity is not the wisdom of the world. Spiritual maturity then, what we see outlined by Paul, begins with God. Secondly, this morning, spiritual maturity begins with God. Look at verse 7 through 9. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. Spiritual maturity begins with God, Amen. begins with a relationship with him. The wisdom of a mature believer is something different from the world because it's something you can't learn from reason. It's something that God must disclose. Something he gives us because of our sin and we were all there at one time in our life. We were unable to grasp God's wisdom. Our eyes were blinded. It was foolishness to us. Remember when you were there? Remember before you were saved, before you were a child of God? That's really how we thought. It didn't make sense. God reveals the truth to us. One commentator said, looking at this portion of scripture, he said in verse 9, Paul says, God's design and plan is something no man could imagine or think of. It's something that is better than anything the world can offer. It's something that even confounds and runs counter to contemporary wisdom. He then goes on to really show the difference between the world and then really what we know about a relationship with the Lord. He says the world tells us to indulge our desires to find happiness. God tells us to control our desires so we can know joy. They contrast each other, don't they? The world tells us to, to fight, to exact judgment, to get revenge. Because if you don't know, or rather if you don't, you'll be called weak. God's wisdom tells us to love our enemies and to extend forgiveness to others. We don't see a lot of that in the world, do we? Why? Because it's foolishness. The world says we should do whatever we want to get away with. After all, everyone else is doing it. God's wisdom says we'll face judgment for every idle thought and every hidden deed. We don't get away with anything in the eyes of God. The world says medals, trophies, possessions, titles is what's most significant. 
God's wisdom says character and commitment are the most important things. Notice, see, in your life, when you became a child of God, then you begin to grow. You begin to mature in your walk, in your faith, and that's because you began to understand what being a Christian was all about. Now you had a new relationship. Now you were a child of God where once you were not before. Now what once seemed foolishness to you, what seemed to be just something that didn't make sense, now it's as we talked about last week, how a light just kind of goes on and we get it. We understand what the Bible talks about when it talks about how we can have joy through trials, how we can have peace through suffering, how, how God provides our need when, when, we, when we need it most. We can rely on him. It's all through relationship with him. Thirdly, this morning we'll move on. Spiritual maturity is produced by the Holy Spirit. Paul points this out in verse 10 through 13. But God hath revealed them unto us by his, what is that? Spirit. Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now look at this. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, the light goes on. You become born again. You become a child of God. What happens? We get the Spirit of God in our life. He indwells us. He's with us everywhere we go. Bible teaches this principle. Christ taught this very principle. You can turn there if you'd like to. The book of John will be in it just for a couple minutes here. Hold your finger in 1 Corinthians. With John chapter 14. Very familiar scriptures to maybe many of you. John 14 verse 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that comforter is the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, even now, here is what he does, even the spirit of truth, that comforter, he is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot, what's it say? Receive. Remember, it's foolishness. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Listen, this is a promise to us as believers. You're saved today. The Holy Spirit of God indwells your life. The spirit of truth is within you. Go over to John chapter 16. The thought is continued. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Same illustration, even the same title there. He will guide you into what? All truth. Isn't that something? Not the wisdom of man. Not the wisdom of the world. But all truth, for he that for he shall not speak of himself. Remember, this is the spirit we're talking about. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he that shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Christ said the Holy Spirit would live in us and help us to know the mind and wisdom of God. It's no longer foolishness. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit equips us to serve the Lord each and every day. Paul taught that the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who believes. Fact is, if you were to look in Romans, Paul teaches another principle there in Romans that a person who does not have the Spirit of God 
does not really belong to Christ. They're not a believer. You can't be. There's no such thing in this day and age of grace in which we live in. If you're born again, you have the Spirit of God within you. <clears throat> Holy Spirit helps us begin to grasp the nature of God's holiness. It helps us to begin to grasp the necessity of a payment for sin. It helps us to grasp the biblical truths that we now stand on and understand and just have such an impact in our life. We're introduced in a new way to the nature of God's love where once it was foolishness. Holy Spirit is a vital agent in our spiritual maturity. So we're going to close the next few moments here together. See, how do we wrap this all up for today? Remember the context of what Paul was teaching. The people of this church at Corinth, they were conflicted with one another, right? We saw the schisms, we saw the groups formed. Paul wanted the church to understand that if they were living by the Holy Spirit, catch this now, if they were living by the Holy Spirit, if they were being led by the Holy Spirit, they should never entertain the spirit of competition with other believers. In other words, he's saying, listen, if you're living in the Spirit, you ought not to be at aught with one another. If you're following the Spirit the way each and every one of you ought to be, there ought not to be any division. He, he would say it this way, the Spirit of God does not tear apart the body of Christ by divisions. It just doesn't make sense. Those things don't go together. The Spirit of God wants God's people to work together. The Spirit of God wants to try to teach and instruct and help the body of believers and help a church to grow and to unify. The Spirit of God does not bring disunity. I believe it's possible the reason there are so many churches experiencing conflict and division is because spiritual maturity is lacking in our day. Pastor Lane, you mentioned in Sunday school, we see a falling away. We see a falling away of people that once held to this book. Say, so how is this happening with, within those that are supposed to be believers? Because there's a spiritual maturity that's lacking. Spiritual maturity is not just for those giants of the faith, mind you. This is what's so special and interesting about the Word of God. I think sometimes we think we read stories and illustrations and historical truths about Peter and Paul and James and the apostles, the disciples, some of those Old Testament uh, 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 just saints that we've grown to love. And listen, spiritual maturity was not just for them. This is what's so wonderful about having the Holy Spirit within you today. God wants all of his children to continue to grow and to walk with him each and every day. It's for all of us. Myself as pastor and you as well. And in that, there's no greater need for one or the other. God wants me to be walking with the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to work in my life to grow mature, to spiritually mature, just as much as he wants you to as well. Why? Because we're his child. So as a church here, as we, as we decided to take this book as our theme and as we decide to, decide to labor together, and I would even say maintain or even strengthen the unity that we have here at Community Baptist Church. Listen to me. Let's do our part individually now, all of us individually growing in our relationship and maturing spiritually each and every day. See, it's for all of us. So the question is, are you growing are you spiritually maturing today? Are you any more spiritually mature today than you were, we'll say, a week ago or last month or last year? Have you become stagnant in your life? Is Maybe there's something you need to examine. 
Listen, we all should take notice of that today. We all should seriously consider this truth in our life. I'll put it this way as how we started. There is no excuse to have a spiritual handicap. Listen, there's nothing I can do to prevent the muscular dystrophy. Right? There's nothing I can do to slow it down. There's even really nothing I can do to, to help stop it. All right, It's just going to play its course. However, spiritually, we don't have that excuse. We ought to be growing. We ought to be serving. And in that, here's what's special. God has given us everything we need to grow and to develop and to develop spiritually in our life. Are we going to let him then? Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house today. We're so thankful to have the word of God. And Lord, even as we're praying, as we're discussing the Holy Spirit this morning, we're so thankful, Lord, that as a child of God, your spirit is within us. Lord, that you've given us your spirit to help guide, direct, help teach us. And then, Lord, to help us grow. Lord, to mature in our walk, to mature in our faith, to mature in how we develop spiritually. Lord, you desire us not to just be on the milk of the word, but, Lord, to then get into the meat. And I pray each one here today would have that desire. Lord, we, we see this illustration of the church of Corinth and divisions had arose and because of that they just, Lord, they were spiritually immature. Lord, they weren't seeking after what was most important. They were allowing division to creep in, yet that was not of your spirit. I pray, God, here as a church that, Lord, we would do our part to maintain the unity that we have. Lord, then that even individually for each one that is seated in this auditorium this morning, Lord, that we would each truly desire to grow, to mature, to, to develop in a way that you would have us to, that would be pleasing to you. Help us to walk in the spirit, Lord, as you would so see fit. And then, Lord, as we do that individually, Help that just to be a lighthouse of our church. Help our community, help those around us to see that, Lord, Community Baptist Church has something special. And Lord, that's not of us, it's all of you. We can give you the praise and honor for that as well. Lord, be with each one that's here today. I pray you do a work in their heart as we examine now, Lord, our spiritual maturity together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads about and eyes closed this morning, no one looking around just for a moment. Listen, first and foremost, I'll say this. Do you know the Spirit of God resides in you? Remember, the key to that is you must be a believer. You must be a child of God. There must have been a time in your life where you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're never going to grow spiritually until you receive Christ. It just can't happen. It's always going to remain a bit of foolishness to you. I'd ask you today, consider that. Consider placing your trust and your faith in Christ, what he's done for you. Maybe there's one here today that'd say, Pastor Fisher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I have the Holy Spirit indwelling me, residing in me, and... I'd like to consider that today. I'd like to take care of that today. If that's you, no one else is looking around this morning. This is between you and I and the Lord. Would you slip up your hand just so I can see it? I'd like to pray for you. Say, pray for me. I, I, I want to get this settled. I, I need to be saved today. Is anyone like that at all this morning? I'll look around just for a moment. All right, then I'm talking to a room of believers this morning. Are you growing spiritually? Or have you become a bit stagnant? Maybe we use this word. Has there been a bit of atrophy in your life lately? There ought not to be. Listen, God wants us to grow. He, not only does he desire that we grow, he has given us all the tools we need in this morning, including 
the Holy Spirit of God resides in us. Just take a deep look this morning, my friend. If you're here, you're saying, listen, I'm not growing like I should. I, I know there's some things I need to get right. I, I know there's some areas that I ought to give to the Lord, I ought to work on. Then I'd encourage you to spend some time with the Lord right now. In a moment, you can come to this altar. You can kneel and pray in your seat, but do business with him. But don't leave today without acting upon it. Take that step today to grow in your spiritual walk. Take that step today to mature in your service for the Lord. Lord, bless our invitation. Be with those that are praying right now, considering these truths. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeff, would you come and lead us this morning?